Hey y'all, it's your pal Archie Gamble here. I don't normally do this, but I wanted to put a bit of a prologue on today's vlog, as it is dealing with uh, mature subject matter and uh, issues such as uh, drug use, drug abuse, and addiction. So I wanted to give anyone who's out there a heads up that that is what today is going to be about. I did post this video uh, 48 hours ago in my Patreon, which is what I do. I give patrons a uh, first crack at um, some content and they pay a little stipend of five dollars a month and they get access to stuff that uh, i would share with the public eventually or don't share at all so this is one of those and i wanted to just give you a heads up that you were about to see some stuff that is of a mature uh theme now i wrestle with whether or not to even post this uh you know it, it, it's a very slippery slope when you're a musician to discuss anything to do with drug abuse or addiction or abuse even it's also funny because the culture I grew up in, the bands I worshipped in the 70s, 80s, 90s, that was a badge of honor. You know, bands like Motley Crue and even going back as far as the New York Dolls and Keith Richards, uh, you know, Lou Reed. And I wouldn't so much say as they glorified drug use, but I, I kind of would say it actually. It was part of the culture of rock and roll was that it was cool to to be a... Uh, but in fact, there was even a, for a while they called, you know, elegantly wasted was a, a thing in the 90s, 2000s, right? I mean, they've always gone hand in hand, drugs and rock and roll, and that's not just with rock and roll, with jazz and country and all kinds of music. So, it's, you know, it's a slippery slope. I mean, as someone that has professed to being a drug user in the past, recreational, and also wrestling with problems with prescription medicine, it's hard to talk about because in this business, now especially more than ever, you have to be perceived as being very professional. Which is funny because I always have been. I show up on time with the parts learned and I do the best uh, best job humanly possible. It doesn't matter what I was up to the night before. But in the, especially in the day and age we live in, perhaps rightfully so, your reputation is tied into any rumor of even uh, slight misbehavior, as we'll call it, you know. It's funny because I've seen situations where people that were alcoholics were judging people that were drug users and not give them a gig. Meanwhile, I've worked with both people and the person that was a drug user was far more responsible. I don't want to stray on the topic. Just to say, things aren't always, always as they appear. As a matter of fact, I will give a quick story that involves me professionally. I was at the NAMM show once, which is in, in Los Angeles every January. It's an it's a industry-only showcase for the musical instrument companies to showcase their newest up-and-coming wares for the year. It's not open to the public. And I met up with some professional musician friends, friends that play with international touring bands that I have the privilege of knowing. And I was, uh, every time I fly out to California, the change in the air, the dryness, it, it screws up my sinus passages, right? My nasal passages and my breathing. So it was first thing in the morning and I met up with a heavy duty guitar player whose band I was in talks with about doing a European tour. And another couple musicians that played with an internationally known guitar player that I know. Or that I that we all know of rather that I don't know, but but I know there's band members. And this person who I was trying to get the gig with, his manager Toadie, whatever it is, was standing next to him. So I'm happy, I'm an upbeat person, right? I have my morning tea and you know, and I'm sniffling like, ah, ah, you have to get California air, nothing more, trust me. <laughs> I wouldn't dare walk into a professional situation uh, with even a hint of drug use having been had. You know, I'm not a fucking idiot. And I remember talking to him and I'm, you know, just me, blah, 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 blah. do I'll get the picnic basket, big picnic basket, you know, and, uh, this guy's manager, the, you got a cold? I just met this guy, I just been introduced to him, and I said, no, no, it's California air, just did something in my, it's my nasal passages. Ugh. Like, okay, I'm thinking nothing of it. Move on, we're talking some more. And he looks at me again, and I, I was like, I can see him looking at me, and I'm like, can I help you kind of thing? He goes, you're really uh, bouncy and uh, upbeat. Yeah, I am. That's me. Oh yeah. 
Wait, can you guess what happened? A couple days later, got the email. Yeah, sorry, we're going in another direction. Drummer was. It was unbelievable to me. I would come to it, folks. Trust me. Well, first of all, I wouldn't go to <laughs> um, uh, a meeting like that in an altered state. I'm not a fucking idiot, as I said. And uh, I would admit to you today, if that were the case, it weren't. It was fucking 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, I was just in a good mood in California talking to my friends that had a level of success. So the point being, and I know, I digress, as I do, but it's relevant to the story. It's a slippery slope, you know. I've, I've partied with rock stars that were claiming, in the, like internationally known rock stars that were claiming in the press that they were sober. You weren't sober when I was there, buddy. You were pounding the booze and pounding the lines. So, it's a slippery slope for me to be discussing, but I'm going to open the vault because that's what the ramble's all about. You get to see both sides. So, yeah, anyone that knows me knows, of course, in the past I've uh, in engaged in recreational drug use and, uh, as I said, wrestled with problems at times that have never affected my career, but problems in my personal life with misusing prescription medication, making medication via grief. I own it. There's no shame in, in that. And I did something about it. And today I'm doing great. So, you know, putting that out there. Don't judge me for telling the story. And please don't judge the person who is the main event in the story because they have turned their lives around. And I'm incredibly proud of them, even though I don't know them, they're doing great. But this is a story that is part of the fabric of my life. And I wrestle whether or not wrestle with whether whether or not to share this story. And in the end, I've chose to, because I think you'll enjoy it. And maybe there's a lesson to be learned. And it's my life, and I can discuss it if I want to. And I'm gonna close this up by saying, if you or someone you love has a problem with drugs, addiction, or any kind of issue, I'll pop a number on the screen for Canada where you can get some help. So thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed this vlog, it's a good one. And uh, I hope you subscribe, consider my Patreon. Leave a comment below. Even if you don't like what you see, I'm always learning. Thanks. On with the show. Uh, for those of you returning, thank you for coming back. I appreciate your attendance, your views. Thank you so much. As so for those of you just joining us, welcome to the channel. My name is Glenn Archie Gamble, and I am a 40-year career musician from Ontario, Canada. Um, I use this platform to discuss various things that have happened in my life and career, as well as uh, travel and uh, just opinions and rock and roll, pop culture, books, movies, and things that I find enjoyment in. So. For those of you that have subscribed, also I do appreciate you. I'm so close to a thousand subscribers where I can monetize the channel, and I really appreciate your time. If you're new here and you like what you see, if you could please subscribe, I would appreciate it. So today, this vlog, I've been chewing on this one for a while and trying to decide morally and otherwise whether or not it was correct to film and share. It involves drugs, drug addiction, abuse, uh, which are all very personal subjects. And uh, not all necessarily, you know, the story doesn't just involve me. Although at the time I definitely was abusing drugs. I was not a drug addict. I was someone who was a recreational user of narcotics. Um, however... In thinking this over, I did realize that the other party involved, uh, which is, you know, NHL superstar retired player Theo Fleury, um, has in fact written his own book and released it, where he tells in much, much more detail similar stories to the one that I'm going to share. He's very public about his battles with addiction. Um, uh, you know, in a, a, a childhood rife with sexual abuse and poverty and pretty much any strikes that could be against a kid he had happened to him and he managed to pull himself up out of that and become a success in life. 
amazing, amazing thing to do, and has nothing but my my uh, respect, admiration, and especially for overcoming addiction. So, if I share this story, it's more or less about life on the road and my part of my partaking in this story. It's certainly not a poke at someone that's trying to recover and is recovering. As I said, if Theo Fleury had kept his own stories of abuse and addiction to himself, I certainly wouldn't be the one to come bring him out of the closet and tell people about things that he's done in the past. That said, in the nature of rock and roll, there is some wickedness and there is some after hours behavior that happens that people seem to love to hear about it. I mean, look at the tens of millions of books sold based on rock and roll bad behavior. So after balancing this out with my, you know, in my own mind and battling it out in my own conscience, I don't feel that it's inappropriate to share the story. You can leave your opinion in the comments and I will understand if you feel that it's something I shouldn't have shared. But use the story as, as it's told the best of my memory, best of my knowledge from my side of the story. And that is the night that I met and hung out with NHL superstar Theo Fleury. Now, I've never watched a hockey game in my life, I have to admit, and that's pertinent to the story because I didn't recognize who he was. But from what I understand from what friends have told me, and I read Theo's book afterwards, uh, he played for uh, Chicago, he played for New York Rangers, he played for uh, uh, Calgary Flames. I think he played for Canadian Olympic team, and I'm not sure, Team Canada. Uh, he also has a couple Stanley Cups under his belt, I believe. Not literally, because boy, would that be uncomfortable. But uh, yeah, this is a very, you know, this person has had a lot of incredible success in his life. So, yeah, I'll tell you the story. You can make up your mind whether or not you feel that was my short story to share. So, this was, I honestly don't remember the year, but I believe it would have been back around 2006, 2007, 2008. Actually, maybe earlier. Okay, I was in a band called The Joys for four years, from 2004 to 2008. And that band literally played over 300 shows a year. Without exaggeration, 320 to 340 shows a year. So 365 days a year, so forgive the vagueness of this. But we were on tour, and we were going to Western Canada on tour, like making our way over across the country and gigging. So we got to Calgary, and Calgary area. We had a few nights off, and that's a whole other story about partying with Vince Neil and his band. That'll be another vlog. But we had a couple days off, and then we moved on to a place called Canmore, Alberta, which is about 45 minutes outside of Calgary. And it's a ski resort town like Banff, a smaller version of Banff. I like it there much cooler myself, I think. I, I think it's much cooler, I like it there much better. It's less expensive and less crowded and less tourist. So we are playing at this club. So what happened was, I had called up a friend of mine who was a DJ on a very popular uh, FM station in Calgary. And I had met him from when I was touring with Helix. Great God. No, we kept in touch over the years. And I called him up and said, hey, listen, I'm out here with my new band. Do you want to come and check it out? A, I wanted to see my friend, and B, was hoping to maybe get him, you know, if he enjoyed the band, to get some radio support down the line when we released the music. He goes, yeah, I'm going to bring a friend of mine. You put two on the guest list, and I said, sure. So as it happens, Canmore was the last show of the tour. We'd been gone for about a month, I think, doing dates all the way across the country. In some cases, multiple nights. And we uh, were playing the last night of the tour, and then the next morning we were heading home back, driving straight back home to Ontario. Not straight, but driving with brakes, no gigs. We were working our way back. We were going straight home for some time off, a couple days off. So we're in a celebratory mood. Bar's packed, and I put my friend plus one at the, uh, on the guest list. Do the show, great show. That goes really well. I remember there was a bunch of tourists there from Mexico. It wasn't quite winter yet. 
So it wasn't ski season, but for some reason they were there, like a, like a basically a busload of people that had been on some kind of trip. Young people in their 20s and early, late teens, early 20s. And so the atmosphere was electric. People were, you know, the crowd when the crowd was moving up and down and really, really responsive. It was a great night. And as we were leaving the stage, I ran into my friend from the radio station. I said, hey, brother, it's a good show, man, you know. So this warm room, whatever, you know, 902. Come on down after you get cleaned up. I introduced him to my buddy. I said, sure. So I went to my room and, you know, probably had a quick shower without washing my hair and put some clean clothes on. And I go down the hall, I knock on the door. And my buddy answers him, gives me a big hug. He says, come on in. Now I walk in a typical hotel room. You walk in, there's a bathroom right to the right. And then when you go in, there's two beds to the right and a window and a table by the window. And there's a guy, fairly short, medium height, sitting at a table though. Um, and he's got a look at it. He's got a mountain of cocaine in front of him. And he's cutting up lines on a mirror or a picture off the wall or something, I forget. And my buddy goes, <laughs> Archie, I'd like you to meet my friend, Tito. Now I wear hearing aids. My hearing is bad for 40 years of touring. I don't wear them on stage, but I digress. So I had thought that what he said was, this is my friend Tito. And I said, oh, walk up, it's nice to meet you. And he stood up. He was, he was you know, like I said, short, like fire plug, stocky guy. And he was wearing these black slacks and his pockets were bulging, like out. And I remember, well, that's kind of strange. He points at the pile of blow on the table, says, you know, do you indulge? Help yourself. It's like a little mountain volcano of cocaine, right? So I did, and it was really, really strong. Now I'm not, you know, back then, I was a lot younger. This is 20 years ago, remember? I like to indulge him now and then. This was after the show, and I'd had a few drinks. And, uh, you know, it's no big secret to anyone that knows me. I'm quite open about my past drug use, and never before playing, and never interfered with my career or the show. But uh, yeah, I like to have a good time as any younger person would, right? So I said, wow, thanks, man, that's really good. I go, where's the rest of your band? So I said, well, you know, they don't really indulge. He goes, well, does anybody? He said, yeah, we'll go get them. So I leave and I go back to our rooms and I'm wired from this coke, right? And there's a huge pile of it and he's got bags full in his pockets. So I go back and I grab, now it wasn't just the band on tour, we also had road crew, people that drove. So I grabbed two people and I won't say who because it's not my place to tell their story. Two of the guys came back with me to the room. Crew or band, you decide, I'm not gonna say. So we get in there and uh, I knock on the door, open it up and we walk in and I go, Hey, Tito, this is black. And the person with their face goes white, the jaw hits the floor. He says, hey, how you doing? He grabbed me, pulled me in the bathroom. We're standing right by the bathroom, which is right by the door. Closes the door, he goes, do you know who that is? I go, yeah, it's Tito, the Coke dealer here. And he goes, no, you idiot. He goes, that's Theo Fleury. He's an NHL superstar. He's, you know, it starts to start, um, this guy's a huge hockey fan. Starts right, like, ripping off huge statistics about Stanley Cups and Team Canada, I believe, and I guess I said all this stuff. Like, well, I don't know, I thought his name was Tito. <laughs> we go back out, and I introduce the property, and my friend's, you know, being cool, but he's like, hey man, I watched you play with, you know, New York Rangers against blah, 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 and they had a little conversation about hockey. And I was honest with him, I said, dude, I'm sorry. I have to tell you. I had no idea. I thought your name was Tito. And he laughed his balls off. And I said, yo, I've never watched a hockey game in my life, but you seem like a really good guy. And it's really nice to meet you. So at this point, he, he's putting more blowout. And there's also vodka and drinks. And it's it's the music, talking, having a good time. And after I indulged a little bit, it's something that I like to do when I can. I said, listen, man, can I give you... 50 bucks or something, like give, give, give me 20, 50 bucks. You're being very generous with this. And he looked at me and he goes, no, it's okay, I've got lost. 
I'm looking at me funny. A little while later, he told me, put me aside, and we were chatting. He goes, you know, you're the only person that's ever offered to pay. And shook my hand, and he said, thank you. Uh, it hit me after, it really hit me after I read his autobiography and learned more about him. A lot of people rode the gravy train with this guy. He was a multimillionaire, and they just basically leached off of him for decades. He tells the story in his book about going to a club in New York City where he played for the Rangers. And uh, it was like a, a thousand people or something, this big nightclub. And he bought a round for the entire bar. You know, just so many crazy stories like that. Again, that's why I don't feel too bad telling this story. Not to mention, my mom, my brothers have passed away. It's not a good thing, but I am more comfortable telling stories like this. I would never break my mother's heart by saying something like this about I had used recreational drugs, although she knows, of course, that I was not an angel. But anyway, back to the story. So, I didn't know anything about this guy, but after talking, this isn't just me after the fact making up facts. He looked haunted in his eyes. You ever meet somebody that looks like that? They're just like, behind their eyes, it's just like, there's a hollowness to them. Like they've been traumatized. As a matter of fact, I saw Stone Temple Pilot shortly before Scott Whalen passed away and, and he had the exact same look in his eye. It was up near the front and I could see it. It was like he was gone. This guy had that similar look. So, as we were talking, he told us that, you know, he played guitar and sang for fun. I said, oh, cool. And then, of course, you know, if, you, if you've ever done cocaine, if you haven't done cocaine, good, don't, because it's a stupid drug. You know, as John Lennon said, cocaine makes you feel like a new man. And unfortunately, the only thing that new man wants is more cocaine. So, stay away from me, kids. It's dumb. You know, not to be a hypocrite, but it's true, right? You either eventually stop or die. So, he was telling us about that, that he liked to he sing and play music. And of course, I came up with, you know, you're full of, you you know, like how John used to say when he was on blow, he could, he could fix the world's problems, right? And I had it all set up. We're going to form a band. We're going to call it Theo Fleury and the All-Stars. We'll be the All-Stars. We'll go on a tour together. We'll come out and open the show with the joys. Take a break, and then we'll come back out, and we'll back you if you sing classic rock covers. Great idea, man. That's awesome. You only... <laughs> Exchange the email addresses. And I even wrote to him about it a couple of days after that when we got home. Never hear from him again, of course, but I digress. So, yeah, you know, you could just tell that this guy bit through some heavy shit. And uh, I think he appreciated the fact that I'm not a sports fan, a and the other person that was with me was asking him a million questions. He was cool about it, but you could tell he was ultra excited to be near his hockey hero. And I gravitated to me a little more because I think I didn't give a shit. Because I don't know. I've never watched a complete hockey game. Anyway, so I read, the, I, I read it. I made a point of reading his book uh, a while later. And yeah, just like this guy burned through millions. And lost his family, and I think that he went you know, when he went to rehab and cleaned up, and got his family back, if I'm not mistaken. Turned his life around. He's a motivational speaker now. Plays for he he was playing after the He went back to playing for minor leagues just for the love of playing. Um, you know, he's a successfully recovered addict, and I'm so proud of him for doing that. Because you could see, you, know, you read the book after thought, the tales of abuse and trauma that happened this kind of young age. You could see it eating at him. Even though I didn't know what it was, you could tell there was something that went black in his heart. And in retrospect, I feel terrible about it. But at the time, it was just a good time with a nice guy, you know? And uh, but here's the funny thing. Here's where he outshined any rock star I've ever partied with. And I've been in situations with rock stars staying up till the sun comes up. Maybe I'll tell some of them, maybe I won't. But this one, so all of a sudden, you know, the sun's been up for a little while. And it's like, holy shit, we got a lobby call. We're leaving to drive back to Ontario. And, uh, oh, sorry. Let's go back to the beginning of the story. I forgot this pertinent detail, but it's, it's fine. When I first came in the room after the show and my friend introduced me to Tito, he said to him, he goes, 
He's the drummer of the band. The guy goes, yeah, you guys are, you know, this guy, Tito. Says, yeah, you guys are really good. I really enjoyed the show. And my friend says, they're driving back to Ontario tomorrow, straight through. He reached into his pocket, pulled out two grams of blow, and threw it across the room to me. He goes, that's for the drive home. That's a very important factor. I forgot the story, and I just remembered it now. Forgive me, but... So this is the two minutes of meeting this guy. So then fast forward to the end of the end of the session. Me and the guy from the band realized we gotta go, we gotta pack, we gotta be in the van in a half hour. Try to take a shower and sober up. And he's on the phone. And I just calling somebody in Calgary. All of a sudden, as we're leaving, two women walk in with vodka in their hands, bottles of vodka in their hands. Said, see you later, guys. I just kept the party going. Like he was more rock star than most rock stars I know. Now, I'm not going to say that he called those women for companionship. I honestly don't know. And I, I don't think so. I think it might have been drug dealers or something. Or friends or whatever it is. I don't Or they brought him booze, I think is what we, booze were at. I don't know if I remember correctly. But anyway, it was the next morning while well, we're getting ready to pack it in. You know, this guy's just, his motor's just getting rubbed up. I went back to my room, had a quick shower, threw my stuff in the suitcase, got in the van. And this part's a little embarrassing, but I will admit it. See, here's why I'm reluctant to admit some stuff. I'm at the tail end of my career, so it doesn't really matter as much anymore. But if you get the reputation in the music industry as being a, a drug person, people don't differentiate between, some people don't differentiate between responsible recreational drug use and being a drug addict, abuser. So if you get known for doing drugs, a lot of times you won't even be considered for certain tours or even auditions and stuff. So I can't tell you how many big names I've met that did drugs, but they were so secretive about it, it was unbelievable. I'm at the stage of my life where I don't really care too much. So, but this next part is a little embarrassing. So after showering and getting stuff together, getting in the van, the way our van was set up was that there were three bunch of seats and a bed built into the back, and then the driver's and passenger seat. So me and the person that was indulging with me were both lying on a bench seat, one in front of the other. And we're wired. Now, as I said, when you're on, cocaine's like laying chips. You have one, you can't just have one, you want more, right? And we're driving away, and I remember I had the two grams in my pocket. And we were passing a gram back and forth between the wall of the seat and doing little bumps off of our head until it was like, well, you know what? It's time to crash. It's embarrassing, but you know, when you're high at the time, if anyone that has done blow knows what I'm talking about. Some people are blessed with the ability to do one or two lines, enjoy it for what it is and call it a night, and other people can't stop until there's none left. I'm somewhere in the middle. In this case, we did stop. But we kept it going once in the van, a secret away from the rest of the band. They probably don't even know it, but we were back there passing it back between the, the wall, between the seats, and finally crashed and slept for probably nine, ten hours. So there's the story, ladies and gentlemen, of uh, a night of debauchery with an NHL star that was more rock star than most rock stars, just in terms of consumption and ability to put them away. So once again... Thanks for, for joining me. I do appreciate it. You can leave your comments below. Uh, and if you haven't, as I said, please subscribe. Uh, and also, if you will, take a second. I have recently started a Patreon page. And uh, basically, you can support my endeavors with a small monthly cash stipend. Uh, it's $5 Canadian, which is about $3 American. And basically, on that channel, I'll offer stories that I don't share in this very public forum and pictures and exclusive content. Just think of it as buying me a beer or a coffee, sitting down and I'm telling you road stories. So I'll put the link in the description. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate you joining me for this ramble. And hopefully I'll see you for more. Take care.